Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to our discussion. We're so glad that you have joined us. We've been doing this summary of the various books of the Bible and what uh, we can find that these books say about God. And we have been working recently in Isaiah and Jeremiah. I'd like to go to uh, Jeremiah 9. And if you have a Bible, open yours to Jeremiah 9. And let's go to verse 23, where it says, Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight, saith the Lord. Mm -hmm. One commentary uh, had some interesting words about that. Like our Savior, we are in this world to do service for God. We are here to become like God in character and by a life of service to reveal Him to the world. A knowledge of God is the foundation of all true education and of all true service. It is on the only real safeguard against temptation. It is this alone that can make us like God in character. Wow. Jeremiah has been giving messages and talking to the people and having his secretaries read in front of the, the temple. Is this the essence of the message that he's trying to get these people to understand? I think so. I think it is. Um, he's, he's saying that, you know, you might make all kinds of money. You might think you're really rich. You might think you're strong and powerful. Maybe you control the army. Maybe you're a general. Mm. Whatever it is that you think you can boast about that's a human characteristic, it's nothing compared to having a true and honest and, and uh, an honest knowledge of God and having a relationship with Him. And remember that Jeremiah lived at a time when things were really, really bad. He lived through the final three conquests of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar from Babylon and until the, the the city of Jerusalem was literally flattened and just totally devastated, totally. When they came back from Babylonian captivity of Jerusalem, it was nothing but a pile of rubble. And that was, that, Nebuchadnezzar finally did that because they, they rebelled twice against his, his, his directions and his guidance. And he finally said, I just can't, I'm not going to come all the way back over here and conquer this place again. I've had enough. And God finally in the book of Jeremiah says, I've come, I've worked with my people for hundreds of years now, and they have gotten to the place when they're, where they are more wicked than the nations I drove out before them to make a place for them to live here in the land of Canaan. I, I guess we have to ask the question, what kind of God would it be with people like this who would send Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel time after time back to give them messages even though they're rejected, mm -hmm. they reject it again and again and again. What does that say about God? Yeah, and the fact that the prophets themselves were tortured and, and just treated terribly and so forth. Uh, they had to escape for their lives. Jeremiah and his prophet had to escape from their for their lives several times yeah. in order to just keep from being completely annihilated. Jeremiah is another one of those books which talks about uh, the devil and his origin. Look at that back in Isaiah, um, I'm sorry, Jeremiah. Uh, I'm sorry, I wanted to say something different. Um, 
I was thinking of Ezekiel and Jeremiah. It's one of those books that talks about the, the great controversy. Uh, it talks about are we prepared to live in our day a correct and honest picture of God? Do we understand God well enough in our day to, to represent Him correctly? Do we have a relationship with Him that changes us so that we can become more like Him? Um, Jeremiah 2, verse 5, we looked at last time, but let me just read that for you one more time to give you an idea what God has to say about him, about it. The Lord says, What accusations did your ancestors bring against me? What made them turn away from me? They worshipped worthless idols and became worthless themselves. These are God's true people. These, or they were supposed to be God's true people. They were the ones identified with God. They were the ones, everybody around them knew that their, their God was supposed to be Yahweh. And what, what were they saying about God by the way they were behaving? They worked out the law that they became like what they worshipped and admired. <laughs> they became worthless because they worshiped exactly. worthless gods. Yeah. Um, so the people of privilege, the Israelites, rejected God and what more could he do? Yeah. Look at verse 8 in the same chapter, Jeremiah 2, verse 8. The priest did not ask, where is the Lord? My own priest did not know me. The rulers rebelled against me. The prophets spoke in the name of Baal and worshipped idol, useless idols. So, I mean, here we have prophets, priests, and, and rulers, kings, if you will, all turning to Baals instead of to God. I mean, what more can, what, what could you do as God? Well, that's, what that the t that's the type of what's happening now in the antitype, is it not? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it got everybody's got all these gods, all these religions are uh, all point to some god. They don't know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. Confusion. Uh, we've talked about, both Isaiah and Jeremiah have talked about uh, how worthless idols are. Look, at, for example, at Jeremiah 10. People of Israel, I'm reading starting from verse 1. People of Israel, listen to the message that the Lord has for you. He says, do not follow the ways of other nations. Do not be disturbed by unusual sights in the sky, even though other nations are terrified. The religion of these people is worthless. A tree is cut down in the forest. It is carved by the tools of the woodworker and decorated with silver and gold. It is fastened down with nails to keep it from falling over. Such idols are like scarecrows in a field of melons. They cannot speak. They have, they have to be carried because they cannot walk. Do not uh, be afraid of them. They can cause you no harm. They can do you no good. Lord, there is no one like you. You are mighty and your name is great and wonderful. These are, of course, now are the words of Jeremiah. Who would not honor you, the king of all nations? You deserve to be honored. There is no one like you among all the wise men of the nations or among any of their kings. All of them are stupid and foolish. What can they learn from wooden idols? Then uh, going down, there's verses about the, the Ethiopian and the leopard can't change their skin or their spots. Um, there's an interesting verse in chapter 14, verse 7. Um, My people cry out to me, even though our sins accuse us. Help us, Lord, as you have promised. We have turned away from you many times. We have sinned against you. Um, the, the, if you read, read in the New American Standard Bible, it'll say, Although our iniquities testify against us, O Lord, act for your name's sake. And we saw that in Isaiah. We're going to see it again in Ezekiel. God must do something for his name's sake. And then Jeremiah 7, 16, 11, 14, 14, 11 to 12, he says, I will not accept their prayers. I will not listen to them because of the, their behavior. And so I would ask the question, which is a major question in all of these major prophets, what is the relationship between their misbehavior and God's actions letting them go into captivity? What's the relationship between that, between those two things? Letting them Cause go. Cause and effect. In. Cause and effect. Letting them go is an expression of God's anger, mm -hmm. is what we've read several mm -hmm. places in the past. So we're, are you suggesting then that the terrible things that are happening to them are not because God is particularly punishing them, but simply that he's letting them, he's taking away his protection because he can no longer protect people who are misrepresenting and that's him. a discipline for the purpose of teaching. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
because they continually rejected his, uh, his help, his guidance. When they had finally gotten so bad that most of them had been taken up into captivity, Isaiah, I'm, I'm sorry, Jeremiah responds in chapter 31, and look at verse 31, a very famous passage in Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah, I'm sorry, I keep saying Isaiah. Jeremiah 31, verses 31 and following, which represents God's attitude. The Lord says, the time is coming when I will make a new covenant, a new promise, a new agreement, if you will, with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It, I, it will not be like the old covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. And when would that be? The the exodus. Exodus. At the Exodus. And what was the agreement they made at the, at the, at, and the, when they came out of Egypt in the Exodus? God said, I'll be your God, you be my people. That's and they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do. They said it three times. Yeah. Exodus 19, 8, Exodus uh, 24, 3, and 7. So now, it will not be like the old covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. Although I was like a husband to them, they did not keep that covenant. We know that six weeks later, they were dancing drunk and naked around a golden calf. The new covenant that I will make with the people of Israel will be this. I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. None of them will have to teach a neighbor to know the Lord because all will know me from the least to the greatest. I will forgive their sins and I will no longer remember their wrongs. I, the Lord, have spoken. What when, do those verses tell us? When did that happen? Yeah, when did that happen? You mean there won't be any more sacrifices? Sounds like there may come a time when the sacrifices won't be necessary anymore. Would that be when we get to heaven? Well, he said earlier that he didn't even want the sacrifices. All mm -hmm. he wanted to do is live right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and do God's will, right? Yeah. Practice the, 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 the Ten Commandments, etc. But is it a prophecy? Well, what about that? Um, God saying, I'm going to do all these things. Has he done them yet? He's or trying. Has he been able to do them yet? Maybe it would be a better way to put that. We're not to the place where everybody knows the Lord. No. No. He's tried, but people, the people have rejected him. Is there, do we still need to be teaching our neighbors to know the Lord? Mm. Yeah. yeah. We do, don't we? We need to teach ourselves, ourselves to know the Lord. Yeah. Well, but so when did this, when could this possibly be talking about? It must be after the in heaven. Yeah, this has got to be in the new earth and the new heaven. Yeah, well, and it's process interesting. Process happened to make it happen. Mm -hmm. well, of course, that's the story of Scripture, isn't it? And, it's, and the, the the way that's described through the Old Testament and the New Testament, it's called the Day of the Lord. When the Day, day of the Lord happens, then and of course, what do we mean by that? Well, that means the coming, that means the change, that means the destruction of all that's evil, you know, the salvation of all the righteous. So it all goes back to pumpkins. All goes back to pumpkins. So in, um, in the book of Isaiah, I'm jumping back to Isaiah, when it has different chapters titled like the Day of the Lord, that's mm -hmm. what it's talking about? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. The Day of the Lord, which is a, is it a power of the Lord that will come and write these things into the heart? the day heart. of God's judgment. Hmm. The day of God's judgment when he will, he will bring his judgment. So us. when he judges, then it gets written down in your heart. Well, no. He, when he judges, it means what's, what's written down in your heart will be revealed. Okay, but what does this have to do with this second... Um, covenant? Covenant. The new covenant? Yeah. Well... So what it means is that the people who will survive that day of judgment are the ones who have, will have God's, God's law written in their hearts. The ones who have, have cooperated with God long enough, studied His Word, become like Him, etc. Then when all is revealed, He will say, okay, here are the people who have got my law written in their hearts. I can save them. I can't save the rest of you even though I'd like to. Okay. Um, it says that He's going to write it mm -hmm. in their heart. Yes. And so why didn't he do it to everybody? That's the next question. And there's an interesting way it describes this. I will forgive their sins and I will no longer remember their wrongs. Why would he say it that way? That's a funny way to say things. Because he's merciful. 
And he okay. doesn't want to remember Which us. part is merciful? The forgiving of the sins or no longer remembering their wrongs? Both. He doesn't. He wants to look at us for our potential, not for what we've done wrong. Is, is there a difference between forgiving sins and no longer remembering their wrongs? Yeah, that goes together. When you forgive, you have to agree to forget because if you keep harboring that. But he doesn't say, I will forget. He says, I will no longer remember. Is that important? I think that's kind of the same thing. Isn't he saying, I won't treat you on the basis of your history? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've got to... He's not going to get amnesia. I'm going to... I'm going to know that you were what you were, mm -hmm. but we have a new relationship, and I'm not going to talk about that anymore. In the book of Revelation, which is a long ways up ahead still, but in Revelation he says, and it, it says that we already read it in Ecclesiastes, everyone is going to be judged based on what they did. And in order for everyone to be judged on the basis of what they did, those records have to be there. But God is going to say, I'm not going to talk about it. I don't want you to talk about it. If you're righteous, you're not going to waste your time talking about other people's sins. So when he says, I will not remember your sins anymore, he's not saying I've forgotten. He just says, we're not going to talk about it. See? There's nothing wrong with God's memory. See, this is not some, you know, because if, if God were really going to wipe out all trace of sin, then he's going to, have a, going to have to have a giant Bible burning at the gates of the, at the pretty gates because all the saints, is, or many of the saints' sins are recorded right here in Scripture. Yeah, but the onlooking universe has been watching this for thousands sure. of millennia. So what are you going to do with them? What's, yeah. what's this whole thing all about? You yeah, need to answer exactly. those questions. Now, now, I've forgiven somebody, and I forgot what they've done. Mm -hmm. So have I. Well, that makes isn't it a blessing for you, too? Well, you know what I mean when I say I forget what they, I've forgotten what they've done. Uh -huh. You don't dwell on it. Yeah, it doesn't we don't consume want to you. Think about we don't think about it. We don't, mm -hmm. we don't um, bring it up. Mm -hmm. We, you know, it's past. It's done. It's. Who, who got the best benefit out of the forgiving? Probably you did. Because it doesn't consume you with uh, trying to. Mm, it just. Well, there's Bygones. going on to the little book of Lamentations, which is a sort of appendix to the book of Jeremiah. Um, Lamentations was written in a very interesting form. I, I'm not going to take a long time talking about that. If you look at the, the first chapter, there are 22 verses. The second chapter, there are 22 verses. The third chapter, there are 66 verses. The fourth chapter, there are 22 verses. And the fifth chapter, there are 22 verses. That's an interesting pattern. Why do you suppose that is? Memory device. A memory device. Why would that? Why would this help? What has that to do with a memory device? It wasn't uh, each verse started with a, the next letter each, of the alphabet? In the Hebrew al alphabet, there are 22 letters. And in the f chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 4, there's each, le each next verse starts with the next letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And then when you come to chapter 20, the third chapter, it's even more interesting because the first three verses start with the first letter, the next three verses start with the next letter, the next three verses, so three, 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 the 22 verses, uh, uh, letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And it goes on like this until finally at the end of chapter 5, he, I guess he runs out of words to use or whatever, so it sort of breaks down at the end of chapter 5. But this is what was known as a massive acrostic, so it's easy way, an easy way to remember. And what's happening was he's writing the book of Lamentations? Well, I was going to say that it's a good thing the guy that, that put the, the verses down knew all that. Mm -hmm. or else yeah. he, if he would have mixed that up, it would have caused all kinds of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me just read a few words that were made, were comments that were made about the book of Lamentations. Lamentations is a concentrated and intense biblical witness to suffering. Suffering is a huge, unavoidable, unavoidable element in the human condition. To be human is to suffer. No one gets an exemption. It comes as no surprise then to find that our holy scriptures, immersed as they are in the human condition, provide extensive witness to suffering. There are two polar events in the history of the Hebrew people, the exodus from Egypt and the exile into Babylon. Exodus is the definitive story of salvation into a free life. God delivered his people from Egyptian slavery in about 1200 BC. It is a story of freedom. It's accompanied by singing and dancing, an exuberant experience. 
Evil is the definitive story, uh, I'm sorry, exile is the definitive story of judgment accompanied by immense suffering. God's people are taken into Babylonian slavery. The fall of Jerusalem in 587 B.C. marks the event. It is a time of devastation and lament. It is a terrible experience. The two events, exodus and exile, are bookends holding together the wide-ranging experiences of God's people that fall between the exuberance that accompanies salvation and the suffering associated with judgment. Lamentations written out of, exile, out of the exile experience provides the community of faith with a form and vocabulary for dealing with loss and pain. The precipitating event, the fall of Jerusalem, is told in 2 Kings 25 and Jeremiah 52. It is impossible to overstate either the intensity or the complexity of the suffering that came to head in the devastation of Jerusalem and then continued on into the seven years of exile in Babylon. Loss was total. Carnage was rampant. Cannibalism and sacrilege were twin horrors stalking the streets of destroyed Jerusalem. The desperate slaying of innocent children showed complete loss of respect for human worth, and the angry murder of priests showed absolute loss of respect for divine will. The worst that can happen to body and spirit, to person and nation, happened here. A nadir of suffering. And throughout the world, the suffering continues, both in large-scale horrors and in personal agonies. Neither explaining suffering nor offering a program for the elimination of suffering, Lamentations keeps company with the extensive biblical witness that gives dignity to suffering by insisting that God enters our suffering and is companion to our suffering. And those are that's the introduction to Lamentations in uh, the Message Bible. Revelation says that there is going to be suffering such as never has been seen on earth. Mm -hmm. So it's going to exceed this. Yeah. Yeah. This was probably in a relatively small area. Yeah. What's coming in Revelation is worldwide. Yeah. And like I said, they were under siege for about two and a half years. And it came to the place where children were eating their, their dead parents and, dead, and parents were eating their dead children. And I don't, they may even have killed some people that thought they were about to die just so they could eat them. Um, the Book of Lamentations helps to answer the question so often asked in times of distress and difficulty, where is God when things seem to go wrong? Why do the wicked prosper? This book makes it quite clear that many, if not most, of the troubles that we face are our own fault. Fortunately, God never abandons us fully, even if we have done terrible things such as were being done in Jeremiah, in Jerusalem at this time. So what is the relationship between the people's sins, the Lord's anger, the conquest ambitions of their enemies, and the punishment and destruction that result? It's interesting that God calls Nebuchadnezzar his servant. Look at that back in Jeremiah 25, 8 and 9. Now, remember Jeremiah wrote also Lamentations, so they fit together. Look at Jeremiah. And Nebuchadnezzar was the attacking king of the yes. Babylonians. Yes. Attacking Jerusalem. Look at Jeremiah 25, verses 8 and 9. So then, because you would not listen to him, the Lord Almighty says, I am going to send for all the peoples from the north and for my servant, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylonia. I'm going to bring them to fight against Judah and its inhabitants and against all the neighboring nations. I'm going to destroy this nation and its neighbors and leave them in ruins forever. A terrible and shocking sight, I, the Lord, have spoken. Now, what's, did, did Nebuchadnezzar, when he left Babylon and come, came down to Ju Jerusalem, did he think he was doing God's will? Did he think that Yahweh had no. sent him? No. I don't think he had any idea of it. So, um, how, why did God say that it was his will to send Nebuchadnezzar? That doesn't seem to fit, does it? Was he prophesying again about what he did with Cyrus? Yeah. And? Well, how, how else would he say it? Well, I mean, he wouldn't would he? have to say, my servant, King Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, then we, something came out of nowhere that even God didn't have control of. Is well, that possibly so. true? No, it's not true. That's okay. why you'd say that. Lamentations. My servant. Yeah. Lamentations 3, 37 and 38. Right. Who has commanded and it came to pass unless the Lord has anointed it? 
Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that good and evil comes? Mm -hmm. Why should we ever complain when we are punished for our sin? He goes on. Uh, there are incredible things in here. Um, look at Lamentations chapter 4, verse 10. Those, I'm sorry, verse, yeah, verse 10. The disaster that came to my people brought horror. Loving mothers boiled their own children for food. They became... Their food and the destruction of the daughter of my people. Yeah. In modern, in relatively modern times, in the last millennium, uh, there have been three major, major events that have asked people, that have caused people to turn and say, where is God in all of this? The first one was the Black Death in the, what, the 13th century, something like that. The next one was the Lisbon earthquake in the, six, and though that would have been in the 18th century, and then the Holocaust in the 20th century. And it, you just say, where is God in all of this? What is God doing? Can't he do something? Shouldn't he do something? Well, imagine being a city under siege for two and a half years. Two and a half years, a city under siege. And all of this fancy poetry we talked about here was written by Jeremiah during that time. And here he is being in siege there with the rest of the people uh, under very, very difficult circumstances. But the question that, since we're talking about God, the question is this, what should God have done when the people have leave him and leave him and abandon him and do everything he tells them not to do and nothing he tells them to do, to do, what is God supposed to do? Should God force his will on the people or should he let them do what they want to do? Could he force himself on the people? He could. He could, but that would be he what? He's chosen not to. A violation of their freedom, right? right? Right. Yeah, so he chooses not to. And so what is the result? They reap what they have sown, right? Just as the Bible says, Galatians 6 so and 7. So God then looks down the corridors of time under these conditions when he has to let them go. He sees what's going to happen and then puts it down here and says, I'm going to do it to you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Well, Hart, yeah. but then if, if um, we reap what we sow, that sometimes affects innocent people. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's collateral damage for yeah. any yeah. sin. Yeah. We, we know examples of people who, like, on their way to church, and they're hit by a drunk driver, and the whole family is killed. So is that right? Yeah, so the Holocaust and those, the earthquake in Lisbon, that was maybe reaping what we sow, or? Well, perhaps. Uh, just think about this. If God abandoned this earth and let Satan have full control, what do you think he would do? We're going to find out. <laughs> but right now, let's, uh, let's talk about what we already know. <laughs> there would be speculation. There would be big earthquakes, there would be black death, there would be people killing people, and who torturing would, people. And who of all the people living on earth would this, would devil most like to destroy? God's people. The ones who are serving God. So that's the kind of situation we've got going on here. If God steps back and says, okay, Satan, do your thing here or, or whatever place he allows them, then terrible and awful things happen. And in the midst of that, we're going to turn next to Ezekiel and see what he had to say. Don't go away.
Welcome back. We're so glad you decided to stay by. We're taking the, the bird's eye view, the eagle view of, of these uh, books, these major prophets of the Old Testament. We, we're not going to take time to discuss all these things. We discussed them many, many sessions in the past. Uh, I'm gonna, we're turning now to Ezekiel. And Ezekiel is a very, very provocative book. Um, Ezekiel was taken into captivity along with most of the people of Israel, taken down to Babylon. We don't know exactly where he lived, the places he described, we're not sure exactly where they were. But here he is in Babylonian captivity, being a servant, a prophet of God, at the same time being a slave, if you will, of the king of Babylonia. And down there, certain questions were arising. Remember, Jeros uh, Jeremiah is back in Jerusalem. Here he is, Ezekiel down in slavery somewhere not too far from Babylon. And who's in, who's in Babylon itself? Which Jewish, famous Jewish person is in Babylon? Daniel. Daniel. We haven't got to Daniel yet. But here are these three people in different circumstances, very, very different circumstances. And what kind of picture of God did each of these have? And what kind of picture of God did they present? Well, Ezekiel starts out by receiving an incredible vision of God. Uh, we don't have, to, I have time to read all of chapter 1, but look at Ezekiel chapter 1. Um, and there's the wheels within the wheels and so forth. And come down to chap verse 26. Above the dome, there was something that looked like a throne made of sapphire. And sitting on the throne was a figure that looked like a human being. The figure seemed to be shining like bronze in the middle of a fire. Now, we talked before about the fire representing what? God's, God's, God's presence. presence, yeah. Bronze, and look like shining like bronze in the middle of a fire. It shone all over with a bright light that had in it all the colors of the rainbow. This was the dazzling light which shows the presence of the Lord. If you look at one of more traditional translations, it says this was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. What kind of language is that? What does that say to us about God and, and what Ezekiel saw in vision? Any idea? One friend said that this shows God calmly in control. Mm -hmm. Yeah, calmly in control, yes. But it tells us something else about God. What else does it tell us about God? E Ezekiel saw a vision, he says, and I, I, I try to describe it in the best words I can, but I just don't have words to describe what I saw. So it's the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. Okay, that's the best I can do. So it gives us a hint about the struggles that prophets went through when they tried to describe the things they saw in vision. So in Ezekiel, we, we see some absolutely extraordinary things. If you look at chapter 16 and chapter 23, uh, God describes himself as marrying two prostitute women. Imagine, and it talks about decking them out with gold and jewelry and, and dressing them up in, up in fine clothes, etc. And they still ran off to, to commit adultery with other kings and other nations and so forth. Um, and those two prostitutes were the southern kingdom of Judah and the northern kingdom of Israel. Mm -hmm. Why would God describe it like that? Why do you suppose he would use? I mean, God marrying a prostitute? Doesn't that God, seem strange to you? God gave the people of Israel and Judah special privileges, special advantages, and they just ignored it. Mm -hmm. The people just ignored it. And they chose to go their own way, exactly as a prostitute would, right? But they kind of take it for granted and, uh, and just kept, then kept pushing the envelope. And mm -hmm. But I, I think it says something else, too, that it says that he, he wanted the relationship with Israel that is as tight and as close and as satisfying as a marriage relationship. Mm -hmm. But they turned and left him and played the harlot. They mm -hmm. went off wandering other. So it leaves him married to a harlot. Mm -hmm. 
And, and basically, what God is saying here is that the vision he's given to Ezekiel says, it isn't saying this is what I want to happen. This is a description of what has already happened. Yeah. This is a description of what Israel did. God has exercised his power on some occasions. Shows of power may help to get people's attention temporarily. And we should never depend, but we should never depend on them to make a lasting change in people's behavior. Only if we see and learn something that really impacts us after God gets our attention will it ultimately make a difference in our lives. Look at Ezekiel uh, chapter 16. I'm sorry, chapter 20. I'm looking at chapter 20. Um, and let's go down. Let's start with verse 10. And so I led them out of Egypt into the desert. I gave them my commands and taught them my laws, which bring life to anyone who obeys them. I made the keeping of the Sabbath a sign of the agreement between us to remind them that I, the Lord, make them holy. But even in the desert they defied me. They broke my laws, rejected my commands, which bring life to anyone who obeys them. They completely profaned the Sabbath. I was ready to let them feel the force of my anger there in the desert and to destroy them. But I did not, since that would have brought dishonor to my name among the nations which had sent, seen me lead Israel out of Egypt. What was the issue here? Why didn't God destroy the Israelites out there in the wilderness when they rebelled against them so terribly? Just like Moses said, it'd be, it'd be hard on your reputation, Lord. Yeah, when we read on. So I made a vow in the desert that I would not take them to the land I had given them, a rich and fertile land, the finest land of all. And of course, the people he was spoken to, what happened to them? They died in the desert, didn't they? In the desert. I made the vow because they had rejected my commands, broken my laws, and profaned the Sabbath. They preferred to worship their idols. But then I took pity on them. I decided not to kill them there in the desert. Said I warned the young people among them, do not keep the laws your ancestors made. Do not follow their customs or defile yourselves with their idols. But, verse 21, that generation also defied me. They broke my laws and did not keep my commands, which bring life to anyone who obeys them. They profaned the Sabbath, and you see it's a repetition of the words. But I did not, verse 22, since the, I, I did not, I'm sorry, I was ready to let them feel the force of my anger there in the desert to kill them all. This is the next generation. But I did not, since that would have brought disgrace and honor to my name among the nations, which had seen me bring Israel out of Egypt. So I made another vow, and I gave them my laws, verse 25. And notice that verse, then I gave them laws that are not good and commands that do not bring life. I let them defile themselves with their own offerings, and I let them sacrifice their firstborn sons. This was to punish them and show them that I am the Lord. What's happening there? RSV says that I might horrify them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That they might know that I am the Yahweh. What's going on? He's letting them do what they want to do. Yeah. He's letting them do what the nations around them were doing. Mm -hmm. And that's what they want to do. They said, look at these other nations. They're rich and powerful and they're doing all these things. Well, let's do them too. And then he goes on and he talks about further times when other groups did the same thing. It just goes on and on. And chapter 23 is more or less a, a repetition of the, of the same story. Um, then I would like to come to chapter um, 20. We just did 20. We just did 20. Well, I hope we don't miss eight, chapter 18. Yeah, let's go back to 18, because that, that will lead me to where I want to go. The soul that sins shall die. Yeah. The Lord said to me, spoke to me and said, What is this proverb people keep repeating in the land of Israel? The parents ate the sour grapes, but the children got the sour taste. As surely as I am the living God, says the Sovereign Lord, you will not repeat this proverb in Israel anymore. The life of every person belongs to me. The life of the parent as well as that of the child, the person who sins is the one who will die. And then in the chapter he goes on and says, suppose the father does good and the son does bad, the father will be saved. Then if the son does good and the father does bad, the son will be saved. And so forth, right through that chapter. That doesn't sound very much like substitution, does it? No. And you get down, get down to ver, uh, chapter, <coughs> if you've been doing bad things, but stop doing them, mm -hmm. you get down to chapter, me, chapter 18, verse 27. Mm -hmm. 
Again, when a wicked man turns away from the wickedness he has committed and does what is lawful and right, he shall save his life. Yes. Because he considered and turned away from all the transgressions which he had committed, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Mm -hmm. Yet the house of Israel says, The way of the Lord is not just. O house of Israel, are my ways not just? Is it not your ways that are not just? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, says the Lord God, so turn and live. That's uh, verse 32. Look at, look at uh, Ezekiel chapter, well, let's go to 28 next. Just we'll mention it briefly. It's a parallel to Isaiah 14 that we looked at uh, last week. Ezekiel 28. And start with verse, um, well, let's start with verse 11. The Lord spoke to me again, mortal man, he said, grieve for the faith that is waiting for the king of Tyre. Now, back in Isaiah 14, it was well, who? The king of Babylon. The king of Babylon. Now it's the king of Tyre. Tell him what I, the sovereign Lord, am saying. You are once an example of perfection. Think that's really talking about the king of Tyre? No. How wise and handsome you were. You lived in Eden. Did he live in Eden? No, this is talking about Lucifer. The garden of God and wore gems of every kind, rubies and diamonds, topaz, beryl, carnelian, jasper, sapphires, emeralds, garnets. You had ornaments of gold. They were made for you on the day you were created. I put a terrifying angel there to guard you. You lived on my holy mountain and walked among sparkling gems. Your conduct was perfect from the day you were created until you began to do evil. You were busy buying and selling. This led you to violence and so forth and so forth. But it's very interesting because right here in the same chapter, if you go down to verse uh, 20, no, 20, it talks here about a fire will come out of you. Verse 18. Is it 18? So I brought forth yeah. fire yeah. from the midst of you. It consumed you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth in yep. the sight of all who saw you. The book of Revelation reflects on this verse and suggests that when it's all done and said, and finally at the end, the sat Satan and all his followers will destroy themselves. It's not God who destroys them. They will destroy themselves. Now, in these books that we've looked, looked at, several of them now, um, we have suggested that <coughs> God is finally down to the place where he has to do something not for the children of Israel's sake, but for his own name's sake. Look especially at, at chapter 36 in Ezekiel. But when he does something for his name's sake, he's really doing it for all of his creation because th they have to learn what, the char what, what his character really is. Yeah. Um, the Lord, and I, let me just read. Um, let's start with verse 16. The Lord spake to me, mortal man, he said, when the Israelites were living in their land, they defiled it by the way they lived and acted. I regarded their behavior as being as ritually unclean as a woman is during her monthly period. I let them feel the force of my anger because of the murders they had committed in the land and because of the idols by which they had defiled it. I condemned them for the way they lived and acted and I scattered them through foreign countries. Wherever they went, wherever they went, they brought disgrace on my holy name. Now, let's stop and ask a question. How did they bring disgrace on God's name wherever they went? Well, the surrounding nations knew that they had some relationship with this God. Mm -hmm. and the then, name of Yahweh was connected to Israel right. and Judah, wasn't it? And so then they, they living like the others, <laughs> they're, they're you know, profaning it. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. Um, these well, they were they were making a statement about who God was and what he was like by, by their actions. Yeah. And that was a lie. Wherever they went, it says, they brought disgrace on my holy name because the people would say, these are the people of the Lord. These are the people of Yahweh. They, but they, have, they had to leave his land. That made me concerned for my holy name since the Israelites brought disgrace on it everywhere they went. Now then, give the Israelites the message that I, the sovereign Lord, have for them. What am I going to do is for the sake of you, is not for the sake of you Israelites, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have disgraced in every country where you have gone. When I demonstrate to the nations the holiness of my great name, the name you disgraced among them, then they will know that <clears throat> I am the Lord. I, the sovereign Lord, have spoken. 
So the very fact that they were in in captivity yeah. meant that their God wasn't wasn't powerful enough to protect them, to take care of them. And so God's name was, yeah, your God can't do anything for you. Well, they had come out of Egyptian captivity, remember, and slavery. And a time when after 100 years or so as slaves, people would say, you know, your God must be useless. I mean, what can he do? Why? All of his people are in slavery. And then God did his thing, the 10 plagues on Egypt, and he brought his people powerfully out of of, of Egypt and up, up there and helped them into the land of Canaan. It took a long time, but they finally uh, occupied the land of Canaan. They came under Saul and David and Solomon to a grand. I mean, they were, it was a glorious, glorious kingdom at that point in time. And then it just got worse and worse and worse and worse. By the process of? Their sinning and their turning away from God and worshiping these other gods and so by, forth. By bringing the local paganism into their church. Yep. I don't that understand. seems to be kind of a contemporary thing, doesn't it? Yeah. What, what, what exactly did God do to help his name? Well, that's a good question. One of the obvious things is he said, look, I can't, I can't let people think any longer that you are correctly representing me, so I have to let you go into captivity. I can't have you as a nation here saying, we are the true people of God and we worship Baal, basically. I mean, okay, but uh, when people take over a country, doesn't that make their God look weak? Mm -hmm. So he was okay with looking weak, mm -hmm. but he, he wasn't okay with them mm -hmm. acting the way they were. Mm -hmm. Well, he goes on to say what he's going to do here. Okay, yeah. what does it actually mean for when God says, for my name's sake, I did this? Okay, let's, let's, let's address that question. What would that mean? Reputation? Yeah, it's God's reputation. What we're saying here is that the picture, if you, if you were to, to look at the Old Testament particularly, you, you look through the whole thing and you see there what's going on, and if you realize that this is a contest between the devil and his side and God on his side, who does it look like is winning? It looks like the Satan's devil. winning. It looks like Satan's winning. It seems like everybody is going to more and more sinning, more and more evil, more and more, you know, rebelling against God. It looks like right down through almost everything, Satan is winning. Except the cross. Well, that's New Testament. I haven't got there yet. But yeah. It goes on down and continues the same pattern yeah. till then. Yeah. yeah. Well, that doesn't even look like he's winning the people unless you explain it to him. Unless yeah. there's a Paul there explaining it because it looks like they just took God, put him on the cross, he's gone. The well, problem is three days later he was up. He was up, but he's right. gone again. And look what's happening. Their yeah. sin is keep going. And their people turn the world upside down with Christianity in a few years. And the world is still sinning. Well, look what God says he's going to do. Back to Ezekiel 36, and now I'm going to start with in the middle of verse 23. Um, I, the sovereign Lord, have spoken. I will use you, talking about the Jews, to show the nations that I am holy. I will take you from every nation and country and bring you back to your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and make you clean from all your idols and everything else that has defiled you. I will give you a new heart and a new mind. I will take away your stubborn heart of stone and give you an obedient heart. What's he going to do to demonstrate his power? Well, what, what is he talking about then? When is this going to happen? That's, that's the second question. Answer the first question He's first. He's going to transform us. Yeah. He says he'll heal you all through these... Mm -hmm. prophets, and we'll get into the minor prophets, he says, I'll heal you, I'll restore you. Yeah. You're, you're diseased, you need cleaning, uh, uncleanness. You're in a state. He goes on here, I will put my spirit in you and will see to it that you follow my laws and keep all the commands I have given you. Then you will live in the land I gave your ancestors. You will be my people and I will be your God. When what did that Jeremiah 31 yeah. statement. Yeah, Again. Jeremiah 31, yeah. I will save you from everything that files you. I will command the grain to be plentiful so that you will not have any more famines. I will increase the yield of your fruit trees and your fields so that there will be no more famines to disgrace you among the nations. You will remember your evil conduct and the wrongs that you committed and you will be disgusted with yourselves because of your sins and your iniquities. So when did that happen? 
still wait. When he sends his spirit into us. Yeah. Yeah. So if we have his Holy Spirit. Of course, he is talking about Israel here. Yeah. Uh, has, that, has that changed? It's always had some people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> why is idolatry so bad? Because it takes our focus off of him. Off of uh, it takes our focus off of God, and it turns our focus really on ourselves, doesn't it? Because it's something that we make. It's something that we think we've accomplished. It's a selfish approach. It's a selfish approach. And what does that do to us? Change <clears throat> When we worship something we have made, what we're do what are we doing? We become like that. Yep. We're just getting we're worse. Discerning reason. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What are the modern day idols? Well, I mean, think about. I, the I don't worship. I don't worship a golden image or a stone or wood just carving. Just gold it's made out of. Maybe. <laughs> What's that? My four hundred one k, my yeah, retirement like account. That. Couldn't that be anything that? Um, we dwell on so much that we don't even think about God and it takes away from our relationship. Mm -hmm. So money, getting mm -hmm. married, fashion. The cares of this life. Status and education. We've read a passage from Isaiah and a passage from Jeremiah talking about how foolish it is to, to make idols. But perhaps the best, oh, it should be obvious that we will never achieve a satisfactory healing relationship with our wonderful God if we turn away from Him for any uh, reason and especially if we substitute some other, some artificial God in his place. But I draw, idolatry is worse than that. It leads people to turn to the worst passions of humanity and make them a part of their worship of these gods. In effect, human beings take their own selves and make them bigger than life and create gods that are in their own image. Maybe this is why it is so easy for us to identify with these gods. Yahweh, on the other hand, is asking us to come up to a higher level. He is challenging us to give him an opportunity to help us become like him. Well, were the Middle Ages an example of... You're talking about the Dark Ages? The Dark Ages. Yeah. And the... Uh, Millions of people that were killed and the or and died. the poverty, the feudal mm -hmm. uh, system of government where a few people had something and everybody else was a servant is is that the usual uh, result of forgetting God? Yeah, yeah, I think so. When when human beings take over and try to take the place of God. The results are a disaster, always. The Reformation that tried to bring God back kind of... Lasted for a little while. Lasted for a little while. Now we're going back into that. Mm -hmm. And we expect exactly the same things to happen again. If, if we continue down that pathway, yeah. Well, I mentioned several times that the children of Israel have become even worse than the nations that were before them. Um, look, at, look at some references for that. Look at Ezekiel 5 verse 6, and we're running out of time, so we don't have time to look at a lot of passages. Look at Ezekiel 5, verse 6. And I'll start with verse 5. The Sovereign Lord said, Look at Jerusalem. I put her at the center of the world with other countries all around her, but Jerusalem rebelled against my command and showed that she was more wicked than the other nations, more disobedient than the countries around her. Jerusalem rejected my commands and refused to keep my laws, and so forth. Um, and there are lots of other places, Isaiah 52, 5, Jeremiah 2, 33, Ezekiel 36, 22, Romans 2, 17, even the New Testament. It's talked about basically the same thing. So we believe that God has ability to predict the future, that he can look down and see far ahead. So why would he have chosen Israel if he knew this is where they were going to end up? It wasn't anything. And he brings them back from Babylonian captivity. And what do they do? They finally end up crucifying his son. They go in the ditch on the other side of the road. So why would God pick them? Maybe he wants these, he knows these things have to take place so he can teach us to prevent it. Was there somebody better? On There's a smaller a good scale, he, Israel represents 
all peoples mm -hmm. and, what, and, what, and all bits and pieces of their characters. Some have suggested that the reason God chose Israel is that he knew they would make all the mistakes you can possibly make <laughs> so he could yeah. teach all the lessons he needs to teach. Uh, maybe that's true. So, but so it, what have we learned in these books yeah. about God? Well, if we had enough time to go back and do these books in depth, we would see in the, in the, in the very black background of the devastating things that were happening in those days, these people, the Isaiahs, the Jeremiahs, the Ezekiels, stood out in their individual experiences as people who represented God. They were God's prophets. And they said, can't you see what is happening to you because of your rebellion against God? Can't you see the awful things? I mean, all the way back from Satan's rebellion in heaven, you're still doing the same things. And all the way down, I mean, God brought you out of Egypt. He wanted you to be a wonderful nation. He wanted you to be his people. And what did you do? You rebelled against him to the point where you become worse than the nations God drove out ahead of you. The, you know, why did he do that? Why would he do that when, you're, when you become so wicked and so evil? So we see God dealing with a very, very difficult situation. And his anger, as we have described several times in this class, was finally when they just rebel against him so awfully that there's nothing more God can do, God lets them go. And, and I think that's the major thing that we learn from this, is that God doesn't give up on them until they completely mm -hmm. abandon him. And he, he cries after them as they go. That's right. Yeah. God cries after them and they go. And this is what we see in these books, in, in prayed out and, and parable and symbolism and in the context of what was going on there, God said, I just have to let you go. But I'm going to show my power, I'm going to say something for my name's sake by bringing some of you back. I'm going to, in fact, I'm going to bring back everyone who's willing to come back. It was only a small percentage who actually came back. But God said, I will bring back those who are on my side, those who are willing to listen to us, to, to me. And now in our day, God is giving the same kind of call. He's saying, how many of you are really listening? How many of you are willing to come back? How many of you are willing to make God first priority in your lives and stop worshiping the gods of this earth? And that's something for you to think about. See you next week. <laughs>